You are listening to Thrival Nutrition Podcast, Episode 5. Thanks for tuning in to the Thrival Nutrition Podcast with Lahana Vigliano, where she teaches you how to take back your health with real food. Lahana is a holistic nutritionist that holds a degree in nutrition science, and she studies sports nutrition through the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Lahana founded Thrival Nutrition to share her expertise through podcasts, webinars, group plans, ebooks, one on one coaching, and more. Here is your host, Lahana Vigliano. Hi, guys. Excited to be here another week joining you while you drive, you clean, you know, whatever you may be doing. I appreciate you tuning into the podcast. This week, I have a very special guest that I am stoked about. Liz Fulcher is a certified aromatherapist, owner of Aromatic Wisdom Institute, the School of Creative Aromatherapy. I love her passion to educate others on the correct uses of essential oils as they can be some of the most powerful natural healing methods you can use. I can't wait anymore. Let's just go over and chat with Liz. Hi Liz, I'm so excited to have you on this week. I am so happy that I found someone that knows their stuff about essential oils. Hi Lahana. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. Absolutely. Let's just jump right in and let our listeners know who you are and what you do. Okay. So my name is Liz Fulcher. I am a clinical aromatherapist. I have been using essential oils for 25 years. And I know that it's 25 years because I was living in Rome, Italy, and my son was given an aromatherapy massage when he was born which at the time blew me away. I didn't even know you could massage babies, let alone use smelling oils and things on them. And I was in the hospital for three days and they continued to teach me how to massage him with this unmarked amber bottle with this incredible smelling oil. And I said, what is in this bottle? And they said, oh, it's just some oils that are good for the baby's skin and keep them calm. That was kind of all they said. Before I left, I said, please tell me more. And they said, well, it's actually a base of calendula oil which is an infusion of calendula flowers in was probably olive oil and then they put some roman chamomile in there and so i said i've got to know more so they kind of sent me to a an eburisteria which is a store that sells essential oils in rome and that was my where my journey began and i've learned since then that roman chamomile is very high in a chemical component that is sedative to the central nervous system so my i've come a long way since 1991 Wow, that's awesome. What a great way to like start in essential oils. That's great. Yeah, it really is. I have a blog post called my unusual introduction to um, aromatics because it, it really is. I don't know of another aromatherapy story like mine. So I did that for many years. And then in 2010, I opened the Aromatic Wisdom Institute, which is where I teach now. That's great. How do you like it? I love it. I love it. I love changing lives. I love one of the best things I love, Lahana, is when my students have that aha moment, especially if I'm doing a talk, for example, um, to a community of people who have never heard of essential oils. If I'm a guest, I don't know, even like at the library or something like that. And when people suddenly, I can see the light bulb go off over their head. What? These essential oils not only smell good, but they're therapeutic. There can be, there can be a healing component to them. I was thought it was just for good smelling, you know, making your house smell pretty. I love that moment. Yes, it really is remarkable. I've been there because when I first started getting introduced to essential oils, I just thought it was, you know, smell stuff, what they put in perfumes. But knowing that there is a healing benefit behind it just got me super excited because, I mean, it makes sense. You know, it can hurt us when we inhale bad things like cigarette smoke and things like that. And so I never really thought of like inhaling good stuff and different herbs and plants and how it could heal us. So I was yep. super excited. So you know that aha moment you've had your own. <laughs> yes. Tell us what essential oils are. So essential oils are the basically the aromatic part of a plant. So when you smell a rose, what you're actually smelling is the essential oil within the rose petals. When you peel an orange and you break the skin, you're breaking glands that are in plant in the, the zest of the orange, for example. And what you're smelling is the essential oil. It is 
the, the part of the plant that gives it its signature aroma. Now, not all plants have essential oils. Not all plants with essential oils are used in aromatherapy. In other words, they exist in the plant for reasons that are known, you know, to the plant. And it usually has to do with its um, not getting eaten, you know, with its um, plant's well-being. In a, in a nutshell. And so what has been discovered, I mean, thousands of years ago, is that you can take this plant material. So for example, peppermint, which is a, a plant that most people are familiar with, both the aroma and, you know, the botanical material. So if you take the leaf of the peppermint plant and just imagine for a moment smashing it between your fingers and kind of smelling your hands, it smells minty, doesn't it? I'm sure you've had that experience, Lahana. Yes. And what you're smelling on your hands is actually essential oil, which sits in little glands within the leaves of the plant. And these glands exist in lots of different parts of different plants. So sometimes it's in the leaves. Sometimes, for example, in flowers, it's in the petals. And sometimes, like in the case of cedar wood, it is in actually the trunk, the heart wood of the tree. For other, uh, for the conifers, like they're all your Christmas trees, spruce, fir, uh, Douglas uh, pine, those are the essential oil glands exist in the needles of the plants. And let's say we've got roots, bark uh, can be in the seeds of plants. It just depends. Now with the with the fruits, with citruses, it is exists in the zest, not in the juice, not inside the plant, but all on the um, not inside the fruit, but what's on the outside. So this plant material is then collected, put into boiling water or a steamy environment, and these glands burst open. They they rise up with the steam and are collected, and the steam, which now is water, the steam and, or I should say, the water and the essential oils are separated, and now you have two products. You have an essential oil and you have a hydrosol. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So should I be saving the skins and the zest of the oranges (laughs) well there is a tiny bit of a first of all it takes a lot of plant material to make a little bit of essential oil that is one of the reasons why you see a lot of price variations it may like peppermint's cheap to grow it's abundant it yields a lot of oil so you know it would take um not so much it would it wouldn't be a very expensive oil to produce where if you have something like jasmine flowers um it takes a lot of flowers to yield a tiny bit of oil. So going back to your question, you know, you could take those, the orange, like if you're eating an orange or lemon or grapefruit, put the rinds down the garbage disposal and it's antiseptic for, um, you know, it'll help clean your garbage disposal and make it smell good. So in that sense, you could save them. I love it. I love yeah. using things for other purposes. Me too. I, I don't like throwing things out. <laughs> <laughs> That's thrifty. That's good. So how can these essential oils be used when we do get essential oils? Oh, there are a lot of ways to use them. The first thing that, um, well, first of all, you can use them, I would say for a, a beginner, the best two ways to start using them are through inhalation and through your skin, through topical. So through inhalation, I'll talk about that first. One of the things that I want to say when you ask me um, what are essential oils, so I've explained kind of where they fit in botany, but one of the things that I always like people to know about essential oils are that they are antibacterial. That's they have a lot of therapeutic properties. A lot of um, big fancy words like well, anti, anti uh, antibacterial, antifungal, but also a menagogue, which means that they can help bring on menstruation. Rubefacient, they help bring blood to the surface. They have a lot of incredible therapeutic properties that are helpful for our body. So how you use them. Sometimes depends on um, what you're trying to do. Do you know what I'm saying? What kind of therapeutic effect you want. Yes. But so if you're going with the respiratory inhalation, they're fabulous for the respiratory system. So if you've got anything going on with anything with your respiratory system, it could be a sinus infection. It could be just a stuffy cold. You could have something going on with your bronchioles, with the lungs, uh, throat, a steam inhalation is a really great way to use them. So within the category of inhalation, now you've got steam inhalation, and that's super simple. Just take some hot water, put it one drop of essential oil in, dip your head over the bowl, and breathe in deeply. And what's happening is the molecules from that drop are traveling up into your nose and your back into your throat and so forth. It's very safe. Even kids can do it. I would say for kids under five, uh, there, there are some safety guidelines that you'd want to be very mindful of, but 
So anyway, so there's steam inhalation. I have done steam inhalation, Lahana, around a campfire. You can do them anywhere. That's we, great. My hus- yeah, my husband and I are big campers, and sometimes the smoke will make me um, congested. So I have a dedicated little metal cup, and um, I'll ask my husband pour some hot water in there, and I'll put a drop of maybe peppermint or rosemary or eucalyptus and hold my head over it, and I'll do a steam inhalation right there um, at the campsite. Nifty. Yeah. The other thing, um, again, uh, with inhalation is a really wonderful, fun little tool are nasal inhalers. Have you ever seen one of those nasal inhalers? They're about the size of your thumb. They're fabulous. Once people learn about this little tool, they they love them. So if you remember, I think they still sell them, Vicks uh, nasal inhaler. You can buy these little tubes that go up your nose and you sniff them. Sometimes they're called sniffy sniffy sticks. Uh, I like to call them nasal inhalers. And so you have this plastic tube with a um, cotton wick that goes inside. So you put essential oils on the cotton wick. You put the cotton wick inside this tube, uh, close the little lid that goes with it, and there's a hole at the end and you just sniff it. The reason why I love this for inhalation is because, well, first of all, you can carry this tube anywhere. So A, it's tra- you know it's really mobile. You can put it in your purse. You can put it in, um, you know, backpack. Guys could carry it in their cars. Well, I guess women could as well. <laughs> I was trying to think, how would a guy carry it? But what's great about this method of application is, and it can have a lot of purposes depending on what oils you're using. So for example, you can make a nasal inhaler for sleep. So you, you can use essential oils that are are sedative to the central nervous system and put some oils like lavender, marjoram, chamomile. You could put some of those in there and keep it by your bed and use the nasal inhaler before sleep. You could have one with stimulating oils for the morning with like rosemary and peppermint and eucalyptus. If you are a person who's prone to anxiety, you could make a blend or just put one or two drops of of essential oils in there that are great for anxiety. Lavender is always a good one for anxiety. If you need to focus or concentrate let's say you uh, have a child who's who's studying for exams or you need to do your taxes we're getting into that season now mm-hmm. um, you could make you know my tax in my my focus on my taxes blend something like that and <laughs> put in there I like rosemary and basil they're very good for increasing your mental focus and sniff it while you're doing your taxes uh, let's see what are some other things that come up uh, fear of flying. People can take them on, well, take them on airplanes for relaxation, but also because essential oils are antibacterial and there's a recycled air in an airplane, you could take your inhaler with you and just continue to sniff it. This is what I do. I travel a lot and I always make sure I have a fresh inhaler with me and I just continue to sniff it throughout the flight because I don't want to breathe in other people's germs and it helps kill the bacteria that could be in your nose and just helps keep you your lungs and everything clear love that They're idea lo- lo- yeah inhalation's great if you didn't have an in it, a little tube you could also just put a drop on a tissue and sniff it in we you know in a pinch you could do that so inhalation is the first way i recommend in that it's easy it's safe you can use the a mol- diffuser right oh gosh Yes, I love diffusers. Thank you. A diffuser is an, it's an appliance that you put water in it. You put essential oils in, close it up, and has a hole in the top. And when you turn it on, usually cool mist, sometimes it's steam, but the, the diffusers today pretty much use cool mist, and they're beautiful. I love them when they have little lights in them, and you turn them on at night, and you've got this beautiful light and this aroma coming out. Um, diffusers are awesome. Yes, we love yeah. using it at night. Do you? Is, yes. it, is it lit? It, it lights up? Yes, it has like a blue light. Very nice. Yeah. So They're it's very diffuser. calming. It is. You're absolutely right. And you can have those all over the house. You can have one in the kitchen for, you know, kitchen smells. You can have one in the bedroom for rest. You could have one in a yoga studio. You could have one in um, the living room just to keep the family, uh, just to keep the house smelling good. I went to see a friend of mine today. She's a life coach. And when I stepped into her waiting room, I noticed that she had a new product in there, and I said, what is that smell? It's awful. (laughs) She said, oh, I have the scented sticks, and it was sweet and heavy and cloying. And in truth, I thought she'd had the carpets cleaned, 
And I said, oh, no, no, this smells way too synthetic. This is not good. Get it out of here. We're going to get you a diffuser. So your original question was, how can essential oils be used? So inhalation, I talked about that. And um, using them topically is fabulous. Essential oils can get into your system through your skin. You know, it's the biggest organ in the body. You you can use them in a massage, you can use them in a, a body cream, you can use them in aloe vera gel, you can use them in massage. When you use an essential oil, there's usually one of three reasons. I'm going to get back to the skin thing, but I got to say this first. So I like to say when I teach my students, I say we use essential oils for one of three reasons, either to maintain or support your health means I'm healthy, but I want to stay healthy. So I'm going to use essential oils to continue to ward off bacteria and continue to stabilize my mood and continue to keep my immune system strong, right? So number one, you can use them to um, prevent or, I beg your pardon, to support or maintain good health. You can use them as prevention. So now, okay, my, my colleague is sneezing at the cubicle next to me. I better use some essential oils. I'm going to get out my inhaler because they're sneezing. Or, as I said, in the airplane, using an inhaler with essential oil in an airplane is kind of prevention. Um, If you know that it's a really, really hectic time, my sister's getting married, I'm going to be stressed, I got to plan this wedding, I'm going to make sure that I use a lot of essential oils to keep my immune system boosted. So we've got maintaining when things are good. We've got preventing so things don't get worse. And then the third way we use essential oils is resolution. Now, if I were in the classroom, I might say treat, but I have to be careful with that word (laughs) because I'm not a doctor. We don't treat. But I like to say to resolve a problem. So if I have an infection in my, you know, if I've got a, a cut my hand and I can see that it's starting to get infected, I can use the essential oil of, say, tea tree or lavender on the wound to help resolve it and help it go back to its healthy state. If I notice, if I have, you know, if there's bronchitis, if there is a headache, if there's anything going on in which we're out of balance, call it sickness, essential oils are fabulous for addressing them. So going back to the body, I use them a lot as to maintain and support my good health. I'm I'm actually pretty healthy, Lahana. I um this is one of the hallmarks of people who work with essential oils. We never get sick. <laughs> essential oils are so good for your immune system that we rarely get sick. So I continue to use them and after the bath I get out and I use my body cream, homemade toothpaste, um I'll have my diffuser going in my kitchen. I mean, I use them all day in so many ways. And um, so by doing that, I'm, you know, keeping my body, my health supported and maintained. And of course, I'll prevent and and treat when I feel that's necessary too. That's topical use. So those are the two main ways that, um, that I recommend using them, inhalation and topical application. Okay. So what are your thoughts about ingestion and using oils completely neat, which means no dilution on the skin? Because I know that certain companies promote that. I don't agree with that. So I would love to hear your thoughts on it. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I feel that neat, we call it neat application when you don't use any carrier whatsoever is not for the, is definitely not for the beginner. It's not for the newbie. Uh, There are a lot of things that can go wrong by doing that. So whenever you're using an essential oil and you tend to apply it to your skin, always add the essential oil to what we call a carrier. Essential oils don't mix well with water, but they do mix well with fatty, with lipid environment. So like oil, um, even aloe vera gel, cream, essential oils blend beautifully with those. Put the essential oil in a carrier before you apply it to your skin. If you're going to use the essential oil neat, you're setting yourself up for something we call sensitization, and it has become a big problem, actually, Um, both with old timers like me, who uh, I I don't have that problem, but there are a lot of my my colleagues, I'm considered a veteran, there are a lot of veterans like myself who have been using essential oils for 15, 20, 25 years, um, who have a problem with sensitization because they did not know not to use them neat. And they applied lavender and tea tree and marjoram, I mean, all the oils, frankincense on their skin, behind their ears, on their feet. And there are some who, I mean, there's one woman now, and I I will tell you her name because she herself would tell you this, Marge Clark, uh, who's a brilliant aromatherapist, owns a, a company called Nature's Gift, cannot use lavender 
she has become sensitized to lavender from using it neat for so many years. And I think she's been using essential oils for about 25 years. Wow. Perhaps a bit longer. So sensitization is contact dermatitis. So when you use them neat, you risk the, it's a very, very real thing. I've seen it happen. It's, it's very uncomfortable. And what happens is that when you become intolerant to that essential oil, you can't use it anymore. And sometimes there's what we call cross sensitization. So, for example, if you use black pepper without a carrier, you're just putting it neat on your skin and you become sensitized to it, there's a good chance you'll be also sensitized to like nutmeg. So oils that are similar, you can't use those as well. And it's forever. And it's not like, okay, I'm going to take a break. It's usually forever. You can never use that essential oil again. So sensitization is a big problem. It's also a big waste of oil. There's no reason to just throw them on your skin. You know, um, your oil will last longer. And my belief is that um, co- companies that are telling their people to um, use them neat, sometimes I think it is just to use up the oil faster. Yeah, so I agree. That may be a bit cynical, but I think that's one reason. I feel that there is no reason in the world to use them neat when you can easily um, use them with a carrier. Now, there are exceptions to most rules, and one is that I will put a drop of tea tree neat on a cut, or I will put a little lavender neat on a burn, because lavender is great for burns. So what I'll usually do is, if there's a very specific type of topical wound, and I know that I can address it with either tea tree or lavender, I'll use it and maybe maybe for a day or so, and then I stop. You know, I'm using it purely to heal that wound, and that's a very specific, I use, it's, when I use the neat lahana, it's a specific oil for a specific reason, for a specific length of time. You know what I'm saying? It's a very controlled thing. So if you're, anyone out there's listening, you're using them undiluted, go ahead and get out some, get some beautiful, there's so many fabulous carriers out there. Get yourself some nice jojoba oil or olive oil, Um, I love coconut oil. I was just going to (laughs) say coconut oil. We all love it. Fractionated coconut oil, which is liquid. Add your essential oils to that. And I do have a dilution ratio. If you want to even put it in the show notes, that would be fabulous. Your listeners can can just have a little copy of it then. Um, The dilution ratio that I recommend, and what I mean by that is how many drops of essential oil to how many drops of carrier. Five to six drops of essential oil in one ounce of carrier is one percent and one percent is great for children for older people for anyone who's maybe sensitive one percent is great to start with so two percent is then you know 10 to 12 drops in one ounce two percent is what I use for my everyday use or um, I'm also a massage therapist when I do a massage I might do it at a two percent dilution so a three percent dilution is five 15 to 18 drops of essential oil in one ounce of carrier and that would be for bruise a wound a sprained ankle sore back you know a, a inflammation like an arthritis in the sh- in the elbow for again it's three percent dilution is high so you use it in a specific area for a specific reason no using your essential oils neat uh, unless you it's for a very specific thing and trust me you'll use them longer and happier and they'll last longer absolutely what about ingestion um, okay, ingestion is another one that's not for newbies. So my feeling on ingestion, we could talk about ingestion all day. It's, it's quite a hot topic right now in the world of essential oils. But I feel that there is, there are a number of plant materials out there that are awesome for ingestion if you have a stomach problem. So for example, tea, you know, take a, take a tea, drink a tea, take a tincture or drink hydrosol. Uh, There are probably even herbal remedies that I don't know about because I'm not an herbalist, but there are probably things you can take in capsules and so forth that an herbalist would give you. My feeling is essential oils do their best work externally. They really do their best work when they're applied externally or inhaled. Taking them by mouth, especially with water, can actually be dangerous. A common practice is for people to take uh, peppermint oil, lemon oil, and put a bunch of drops in a glass of water and drink it. Essential oils are not water soluble, which means, I mean, if you've ever put an essential oil, you know, you only have to put a drop in water and you'll see it floats. It does not disperse. It does not sink. It just sits on the top. If you're drinking water with essential oil in it, you actually are, that essential oil is going right into your stomach lining. So there's no protection for your stomach whatsoever. And with time, 
that can be very caustic. And I know people who are doing that with, and I can't even imagine, cinnamon oil, I think with clove, oils that are very, very hot. You know what I mean very by hot? Strong, they burn. yes. Exactly. So I feel that there is, um, definitely do not use essential oils with water. If anyone if ever felt like I, I'm going to take one little drop of peppermint and I'm going to, I'm going to swallow it, put it at least in a teaspoon of, of honey or a glass of whole milk so the fat will help it disperse. Like that, you're protecting your stomach. But first and foremost, I feel for, for most of us, it is absolutely not necessary to ingest. You can use them. Uh, even if you have stomach problems, you can use uh, ginger and peppermint in a stomach rub. Combine that with a nice herbal tea. You have a perfect remedy. I just feel like some, some um, plant medicine works best by mouth and this particular brand of plant medicine essential oils work best externally and of course ideally you want to use them together you know you want to take something maybe a little ginger tea with a ginger essential oil belly rub yeah that sounds good so again if somebody is new it's definitely i mean i have taken essential oils um i have ingested essential oils but in very specific conditions um i i have a I have a, one of my mentors is a a teacher in France and, you know, when I saw her, she gave me a little, it was after lunch, she gave me a little special digestive tablet and she put a tiny bit of tarragon essential oil on there and told me to chew it for digestion. And I said, do you do this often? She says, oh no, it's just for fun. I wanted to do that because you're my guest. But she, it was very controlled. She knew what she was doing and it's still not something she does every day. Absolutely. I think the thing is too is if there is a problem that you do do that to actually find someone that's a certified aromatherapist a therapist Absolutely. versus someone maybe that's just in a business and they're not certified in anything and it's kind of just hearsay such a good point yes thank you the person in my opinion unless somebody's had a good 200 hours of aromatherapy training they should not be telling anyone how to use essential oils and they should definitely not be using them not be ingesting them themselves you know what happens is that we your neighbor becomes your doctor it's kind of like you know so and so says to do this so therefore i'm going to do it or so and so did it therefore i'm going to do it doesn't necessarily mean it's the safest or best way everything i teach lahana comes from science i mean i have for example my certification program we study the 10 chemical families of essential oils and my students go away understanding the chemistry behind why oils do what they do. For example, lavender. I wonder how many people who are new can tell you why lavender is so um, relaxing and good for the skin. Well, it's not because it grows in the fields in France with the sun on the, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of romantic marketing about, you know, lavender and why it, it's calming and it's soothing. Yeah, it's because there are two chemical components, two molecules that make up the lavender essential oil one is called linalool which is very good for the skin and one is a molecule called linal acetate and linal acetate is a natural nervous system sedative so that is why lavender is calming and and safe for the skin and uh, even though you still need a carrier it's not because it's you know it smells good and that is the kind of information that people should be able to regurgitate if they are selling oils and, and teaching, they should be able to absolutely um, understand the science behind what they're, what they're handling. Absolutely. I take yeah. that area with nutrition as well, combining Excellent. the yes. science and the food and the nutrition be- behind it. Absolutely. It's really no different. You're putting plant medicine in your body, in your case through food, in my case through uh, the oils. Yep. Absolutely. Good. What is the best way to reap the most benefits of essential oils? I've personally heard that inhalation is like one of the best ways. Right. Yeah, I agree it is. Because even if it never touches your skin, if you have a diffuser going, if you have a nasal inhaler at your fingertips, you're exposing your, you're getting it into your system both um, physically, the molecules actually enter your nose, get into your bloodstream and they can work systemically. You're um, keeping your respiratory system, you know, healthy. And also you're working with the, with some, you're putting some powerful chemicals in your brain for your well-being. So it works with a limbic system, with the uh, amygdala. That's how it can calm. Like 
anxiety by you know by settling the amygdala so inhalation hands down and there's just something magical about a diffuser you know about just it's just the whole presence of a diffuser and the essential oils very calming very relaxing the best way is the way that you feel comfortable using them as long as it's not neat <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if it's like, I can't be bothered with a diffuser, but I really like to put some in my cream and rub it on my legs before bed, awesome, then you do that. You know, or Ugh, I don't like them on my body, but I really love this little nasal inhaler, then you use that. Most people, once they get their hands on essential oils and they discover the different methods of application, they're all over it. <laughs> they just want to do it all. <laughs> yeah. I'm totally the same way. Yeah. And do higher prices on certain essential oil brands mean that one brand is better than the other? Absolutely not. Nope. That is pure marketing. I have, um, well, first of all, you know that the prices are determined by the, the product. It's an agricultural product. So prices can vary depending on uh, everything from climate to politics, you know, of the country. But uh, so A, essential oils will always have a varying, a, a variety of, of prices, you know, peppermint could be 15 and jasmine will be 100, something like that. Mm -hmm. But just because one company's oils are more expensive than another's, you know, you might want to look at, well, why is why is this company charging $24 for a bottle of lavender and this company over here is charging 18? Is the company that's charging higher you know, is it multi-level marketing? They have to build, and this is nothing against multi-level marketing. It's just, it's just a fact of their business model. The prices have to be higher because they have to pay consultants and, you know, they're, it's, they have a lot of beautiful marketing to pay for. If it's a small mom and pop shop, it may be less expensive because they don't have as much overhead. So essential oils are made by distillers, right? Mm -hmm. So plants are picked and they're taken to the distillers and the distillery makes them. The shortest distance between the user and the distiller is the best. So in other words, if Famously. I... Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It's like that with wine too. <laughs> so much is <laughs> so much with the essential oils and wine is similar. Yes, exactly. If you grow your own food, it's like the best. Yes. Exactly. Now making your own essential oils is tricky because it usually takes acres of fields, uh, acres of um, plant material. Yeah. Which is why develop a relationship either with a distiller and buy your essential oils from them or from someone who buys from the distiller and knows them. So for example, I buy my essential oils primarily from a woman named Jessica Grill. Jessica is a student who she graduated from my certification program in 2012, had a soap company. And after taking the certification class, she was in love with essential oils. And she said, I've got to include these in my product line. So she started, she actually, her, her store is Pompeii Soap Company, but her, she started Pompeii organics and she said I'm going to buy essential oils she started buying essential oils from distillers all over the world so she buys you know rose from Turkey and uh, German chamomile from Nepal and Roman chamomile from England and you know she's buying them f directly from the people who distill them wow that's she, great oh it's fabulous she has a relationship with the distillers so I buy from her therefore there's only one person between me and the distiller and I can say to her I don't know when was this distilled and what were the conditions under which it was distilled the second thing I look for is if the person you're buying the oils from can provide something called a GCMS report does that ring any bells yes I have okay. read about it before I don't do you use those in food I bet you don't no. Probably not. Okay. There would actually no reason, be no reason to. It stands, GCMS stands for gas chroma, wait, oh my Lord, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. It's a, <laughs> it's it's a gas chromat, ugh, gas chromatograph is one machine and a mass spectrometer is another machine. These are two very sophisticated, you know, instruments. And so what these measure are the components in within the essential oil. So I can take a drop of lavender. I don't do it. These are special scientists who do it. Um, Jessica, if she buys lavender, say from India, she will send it off to a chemist, a chemist in France. And he will take her lavender, put a little drop of it into the GC machine, and it will tell, it'll start to spike. And out will come a little piece of paper with all these spikes. And those spikes represent 
the components, you know, how, you know, the volume of different components within the oil. And then it goes into another machine, which is called the mass spectrometer. And that will tell you what those components are. So in the end, all right, so Jess gets the oil back. She's got these, this piece of paper with the, with all these fancy components in there and what Jessica will do is she'll actually break them into chemical families so when I buy my lavender from her I also say may I have the GCMS report for that batch of oil not for your, the year's overview that batch so the bottle I'm holding in my hand and this GCMS report in my hand are the same meaning the the report corresponds with the oil in my hand and I can look at this piece of paper and say oh this oil has 72% linalool and 32% linal acetate. Wow, it's a powerful sedative and it's good for the skin. And oh, look, it's got some other components that are also good for the skin. I may say, look, last year, last batch, the linal acetate was much, much higher. Maybe I want last year's batch because it was better for something else. So it's only by understanding the chemistry of the essential oils that you really understand their therapeutic properties. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Great. Is there um, a difference between I've seen organic essential oils and non-organic right. essential oils? That's per, that's very important. Absolutely organic and versus um, conventional because you have bug spray and things like that. I, I would have to say if it's between buying no essential oil and an essential oil that isn't organic, just buy the buy what you can afford. You know what I'm saying? Okay. If you, but certainly, it's again, it's like food, isn't it? Yeah. Organic's going to be so much more vibrant and alive, and it's healthier for you and for the planet. We vote with our dollars. Yeah. So go organic. So, but the organic actually has nothing to do with the GCMS report. Uh, and the, the GCMS report is not an opinion. It's not like that it's better or it's worse. It's just what is. So I'm going to give you one more example, if I may, about the GCMS report and why it's important yeah go ahead a few years ago a friend of mine bought her chamomile from a guy in nepal and chamomile is is fabulous for german chamomile which is a blue chamomile is very good for inflammation and so she bought this chamomile and her gcms report the components that are good for inflammation the camazuline was very low and she said I've never bought a batch of of um, German chamomile from you before. I mean, this isn't very good for inflammation, but it's high in other components that are great for the respiratory system. So she called the distiller and said, why? Why is the chemistry of your oil so different than the latch bass batch? And he said, because we've had such terrible weather, we had to harvest early. Well, the plant wasn't finished producing its chemicals. So although this wasn't a bad oil, it wasn't great for inflammation, but it was really good for the respiratory system. So, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the GCMS report will simply tell you the best uses for that oil. It's also a sign of professionalism and integrity if an essential oil company can produce those because you're hiding nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they'll show traces of if there are insect uh, pesticides and so forth. That'll also show up in the report. So, yeah, organic is, is always good. Jessica, I my pride and joy <laughs> um <laughs> she is the only one the only essential oil supplier in the united states that has both gcms reports right on her website and her she now it's taken her a whole year god love her of forms and inspections but she has 60 essential oils are usda certified organic awesome well, you, you probably know what a big deal that is that's huge yeah it is so those are the oils i use in my classroom the oils that i purchase are from uh, pompeii organics and the website is pompeii like the city p-o-m-p-e-i-i organics.com i will definitely add those in the show notes for sure yeah. And we'll end with what are your top three must-have essential oils? I know it's so hard to pick. Oh, don't make me choose my top favorite. Well, you mean this week? <laughs> sure. Okay. okay. So actually, one of my top favorites is clary sage, salvia sclerea. And it's a beautiful note, high in esters. It's floral. It's deeply relaxing and sedative. It's um, it's great if you want to increase your dreaming. It smells good. Um, it's great for balancing hormonal issues. I just love it. And, um, and the flower is even stunning. It comes from a gorgeous purple-pink flower. 
My other big favorite, which is such a contrast, is myrrh. Myrrh comes from a resin uh, from a tree in Somalia. It's, you know, a cousin of frankincense. And frankincense is great. I love it. But there's something about the aroma of myrrh that just, oh, I roll my eyes back in my head every time I smell it. I love myrrh, too. It's very strong in a way, uh-huh. but I love the smell of it. Yeah, it's earthy, though, isn't it? Very earthy yes. and grounding. Yeah. And, and another earthy one I love is vetiver which comes from a root. Uh, generally, it grow, it's grown in Haiti, and there's these little tiny roots that produce the essential oil. And it smells, it's funny, it kind of smells like dirt. <laughs> it's because it smells very, very earthy, but it's exquisite blended with uh, flowers or floral oils or with citrus oils. But it's, again, it's kind of in the, it's in the valerian family, so it's very calming, very sedative. I'm a bit wound tight. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I, kind, I have a type A personality. And vetiver is one that can kind of bring me back to center, bring my feet back to the ground and kind of calm me and slow me down. That's I'm... my husband. So there I'm making go. a note in my head. <laughs> there. And you know, it's often used in men's colognes. Okay. And you guys really like the smell of vetiver because it's very masculine. Hmm. Yeah. I like it. Thank Your you. Your three favorite um, oils, Lahana. My three favorite? Yeah. I would definitely say clary sage as well. Um, Good. I love clary sage. I would also say lavender. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a must have. Of course. Um, for us. And I would probably say frankincense as well. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? Well, when you start smelling, when you smell vetiver, you, you know, you may have to add that to the list. <laughs> yes, I am going to, um, because that's awesome. And that's exactly what my husband needs. He needs to be calm sometimes because he's very go, go, go. Right. Um, well, Siberian fur is nice guys like that, uh, that mixed with vetiver, um, a black spruce, those, you could make him a nice hand, even like a, get some Castile soap, put some essential oils in it, put it in a hand pump and, and let him wash his hands with that or put it in the shower, uh, um, you know, make him a nice nighttime, slow down at the end of the day, cream with vetiver, sweet orange is great with vetiver, that's also really nice. Put the two together, see if he likes that, orange and vetiver. Yeah, I will. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for coming. I've had a blast with you. I've learned so much. And... Oh, I'm so glad. And thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. And um, if anyone has any questions, I guess I should give my, my stuff. No, yes, I'm... <laughs> give your stuff. <laughs> my website is aromaticwisdominstitute.com. Dot com And I also have a podcast, aromaticwisdominstitute.com forward slash iTunes. And what are some of your social media accounts? Oh, thank you. On Facebook, it's, you know, Facebook forward slash Aromatic Wisdom Institute. Pinterest is forward slash Liz Fulcher. Twitter is at Liz Fulcher. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh my on. gosh. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Having Liz on the podcast was so much fun and I could talk to her about essential oils forever. If you are interested in finding Liz on social media and her website, I linked it in the show notes and go listen to her podcast on iTunes, Aromatic Wisdom Podcast. And if you're looking for me, you can find me at www.thrivalnutrition.com. And if you're interested in one-on-one consultations or group plans, you can find me there. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. I'll see you next week.